Thank you for tuning in. This is the Rice Crypto Show, and I'm your host, Rice. And on today's episode, I am joined for the fifth time by Lynette Zhang, who is the Chief Market Analyst for ITM Trading. I'm going to have links down below and above for the first four interviews that I did with Lynette, and I definitely encourage people to check those interviews out. Today's episode is less of an interview and more of a discussion. Now, before we get into it, this is your first time ever watching any of my videos. I do encourage you to explore my channel. Make sure you subscribe, smash that like button, hit the notification bell so you can stay up to date with my videos as they come out. Also, follow me on Library where I post exclusive content. And I'm going to have links down below for my library channel. So we're just going to go ahead and get right into today's video. All right, ladies and gentlemen, today I am joined once again by Lynette Zhang. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Lynette, I've got plenty of interviews I've done with her in the past. I'm going to have links down below. I've got a playlist that I've set up. Now, Lynette is the Chief Market Analyst at ITM Trading, and she's, done, she's held that position since 2002. She's been a banker, a stockbroker, studied world currencies since 1987. She really knows what she's talking about. And her motto is food, water, energy, security, community, barterability, and wealth preservation. Lynette, welcome to the show once again. How are you doing today? It's always great to be here, Chris, and thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure, especially considering everything that's going on. Um, you know, I was telling you I wanted to make this more of a discussion, kind of a fireside chat, because mm -hmm. all the previous times we've talked, which I think this will be number five or number six, it's been quite a few over the past year, couple of years. But this is like everything that me and you have been talking about in various interviews has kind of come to like culmination now. And we're at this breaking point, this, this like tip of the iceberg of everything yep. that you've been warning people about. And um, so I just figured it'd be good to have a really cool discussion. And the last time I interviewed you was January 29th. So seems like then, a lifetime ago, doesn't it? It does, especially when I go down this list. Okay, so um, February 2020, we've seen stock markets hit all time highs. We've seen information then come out about COVID 19 starting to get more rampant. It was Sunday, March 8th, that the Dallas futures dropped 2,000 points. And on Monday, March 9th, Upon market opening, everything drops seven percent. Um, that includes S and P five hundred, Nasdaq, and they end up having to throw a circuit breaker, which yeah. ultimately had to be done three different times to stop the system from basically crashing. Then, because everything would have crashed had those circuit breakers not been put into place. Then we see the stimulus package. They talk about two trillion, but it's actually like over six trillion. The quantitative easing infinity, the bailouts of pretty much every industry, crude oil going down to $20.09 a barrel, where it could plunge below 20. And we hear you know, all this information about Russia saying that they can maintain selling at $10 a, a barrel and still be profitable. We're seeing physical gold and silver becoming sold out. As far as I'm aware, I believe the treasury is out of the American Eagles, the Silver Eagles. I think Canada is running out of the maple leaves. Yep. Um, so, I mean, and then like, uh, so then we had the Fed president, Buller, coming out making suggestions about mandatory testing for this virus. And now today, it seems like a little bit of a turnaround. Uh, the 7th of April, markets are up. Dow Jones is soaring based off of optimism for what's going on with this situation. So where do you want to go? Where do you want to start? Where do you want to begin? <laughs> Whoa, you know, and we frankly, it's like a roller coaster, and it feels like we've been on a roller coaster since the end of January, yeah. since you know, especially since the beginning of March. It's been crazy. So, I listened to, I actually listened to a really interesting discussion with Dr. Ron Paul this morning because here's the thing you know, it's scary out there, mm -hmm. and you know, I've been holed up in my house now going on a month, uh, although I do go out in my neighborhood to walk my dog, right. and I do see other, everybody's waving and all of that. But you know, so there is a part of me that definitely sees the danger, but frankly, everything that we're witnessing around this smells and tastes and feels like a currency, a financial system 
regime shift. And we knew that by 2021, that had to happen because the LIBOR, mm -hmm. uh, against which many, many trillions, even more than the trillions we were talking about before. We got well, into that heavily that, last, the last time we talked. And that's going away. Sorry, I didn't mean to, I was going to say, we, we got into that, the LIBOR rates pretty heavily in the last interview. Exactly. So, I mean, that's why there had to be some kind of catastrophe, some kind of black swan event. And now it's all the COVID-19's fault when this was yeah. happening well before that. Right. It's a scapegoat it, because mo most people aren't educated to know what's actually happening, the truth of the situation. And they're going to accept the fact that this is the reason for everything. But we knew since 2008 that the system was done. It was just right. obviously the, the zombie system and life support is starting to unravel. And, and one of the things that Dr. Paul was talking about is how easily we give up our liberties. Yeah, like right now. And we cannot allow that to happen. Well, it's, really, it, we can't. It's more so of giving up liberties for a false sense of security is what it is. I don't know if Ron right. Paul said it like that, but you got to include that false sense of security because we're giving up these liberties thinking that the government is going to protect us. And, you know, they're kind of, if you believe everything that they're saying, look, if I can't prove it, you know, I don't say it. So right. there's a lot in here that I cannot prove. So I want everybody to really understand that. But there's always been a part of me that really has wondered, you know, is this a planned event? I mean, I'm not taking away from the people that are dying. I think this is absolutely horrendous. Some people think that this virus was unleashed. And, and when you stop and look at, I mean, my two key things are your health and your wealth. Mm -hmm. And exactly in that order, and they've been screwing with our health for a very long time. Yes. You know, so if your health is impaired, how clearly can you think? And, you know, I've been, I mean, I just wonder for those people. Yeah, well, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, now, unfortunately, when you're an outside the box person using critical thinking these days, you're being labeled as a conspiracy theorist. And it's really unfair when you're just trying to just, have dialogue and question things. And that's how we should be able to interact as human beings. You know, we should be able to have that right. But and obviously a lot of people are speculating on, on what's happening. I mean, there's uh, the QAnon stuff. I mean, they, they're even talking about the possibility of Donald Trump trying to end the Federal Reserve, nationalizing the currency through the treasury and, and looking at a, a partially or fractionally or fully backed by some sort of precious metal but you know again this is all just speculation you know it seems like right now uh the federal reserve like w the plan of what central banking was created for the diabolical behind the scenes plan it's come to fruition now right. right now the federal reserve are in a position where they are truly becoming the buyers and lenders of last resort and and i don't see the federal reserve giving up that power i mean we've seen now they, uh, the reserve rates for banks have been pretty much just torn away. So now banks aren't even required to hold any reserves. Um, right. That's insane when you think about that. Um, there was something else I was going to mention, but I, could, I mean, there's just so much, so much going on. Um, and it's so much to think about and it's so much to take in. And we don't know what direction we're going because we're not really being fed consistent, correct information. It yeah. just seems to be too much arguing going on on a political state between Democrats and Republicans. And we need to like really come together as human beings and do what's best for everybody. Not, not just kind of fighting each other and think about elections, whether there's going to be an election, whether he's electable, that doesn't matter. Like we really need to think about more important and pressing things right now. Well, you know, for one thing, I am definitely not political because I definitely do believe that that's just a sideshow for to distract you from what's really happening behind the scenes. And so when you talk about the Federal Reserve, you know, and the government nationalizing this or doing that, honestly, the Federal Reserve first started buying US government debt December, I think it was the 13th, I could be off by a couple days. Right. But the end of 2002. 
they already started monetizing government debt. So the fact that that's just only gotten worse, this isn't a new thing. And I would say that that Jay Powell, at least for a couple of minutes, kind of looked pretty good at giving the pushback. But when push came to shove, I mean, we saw the pivot. That didn't just happen now. That happened last year. Yeah. Right? We, we had been warned about a crisis when the interest rates inverted on December 4th of 2018. The real estate market had already downturned the end of 2018. Yeah, I mean, we it knew was it was already, coming. It was, it was what was going to, what was, we knew it was coming. It was just what was going to make it happen. What was going to, exactly. what was going to be that? And would you call this an actual black swan event or how we? hundred percent. Okay. Because I, I wasn't mean, if sure that, if we're, if we Basically if, the global economy shut down. Yes. So you tell me how, what do you think? When we're no longer afraid of COVID-19 and we walk out of their houses, you know, everybody that lost their jobs, 6.6 .6 million people so on far. Thursday, right? Magically, all those jobs are going to come right back. There yeah. are moms and pops, which is the lifeblood of this country. They employ more people. They generate more new jobs. And they are absolutely being annihilated. And look, so they're allowing them to take on, they're allowing some that I guess they believe can survive this to take on debt. Right. That's the solution. And no, so, it's not obviously. Okay. So how? Gonna... I'm sorry. I was gonna. I was gonna ask, and I, and I didn't mean to interrupt you. I know we're having a little bit of a sound issue. Um, how long do you think that the Federal Reserve and central banks are gonna be able to keep this printing up before everything just literally collapses? Well, we first of all, we still have to feel even more pain than we do right now, because it, it's just like everybody is kind of going along with the you know mandatory staying in your homes and and all of that and i mean i get it i'm doing it too right. to be perfectly honest with you i'm not letting anybody that's that is not that i absolutely am not 100 percent certain is going from their house to my house to from my house back to their house and just like that not having contact with anybody i mean I, honestly i'm complying so i'm going to be really honest about that I mean, I'm but, going to too, but it's also, I think it's, it's also out of respect for other people as well, because we don't know if we're carrying something because apparently we can, you know, have this and not even show symptoms. So exactly. And, and just pass it on to somebody else. So, I mean, it's a sign of respect, I think as well. Cause I mean, I don't like to do what I'm told, especially by the government, but in this particular instance, I'm looking at it as more of like, what am I doing to help my, my fellow man, my brother and sister, you know, and, and trying to treat people how I want to be treated. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I feel exactly the same way, you know, but you know, we, I don't think we've felt enough pain yet. This is just the first part of it. When we can start to move about freely again, anybody that has money is going to be very happy to be able to go out and spend money. And so I'm going to be, I'm, I am paying a lot of attention to the monetary velocity Right. Even though they only publish that quarterly and we'll see how long it takes them to come up with the first quarter uh, publishing that number. But it was already abysmal. When that starts to turn up, I think that's what's going to, and it does so in a pervasive way. So not like a cash for clunkers little blip, but it starts to happen in a pervasive way. For me, that's going to be the start of the hyperinflation. That should give everybody a heads up that that that's well, that was, on the way that was going to be my next my next thing i was going to bring up was do you think that we're going to see true hyperinflation like venezuela and zimbabwe or do you think we're going to see like just like a high form of inflation like japan i think it is going to be oh i want to talk about japan because japan was a good example that. because i think it used to be one yen was out it was equal to one ounce of silver at one point in time and now um, it's so devalued because when they did their quarantine of easing, they just went a little bit extra crazy with it. So, because I've been talking to some people that are, that are in Japan and, and 
buy right. something. Well, you know, Japan has no inflation, right? Except that they've been on this path for all that time. And apparently there have been some people that have said, well, can't we just go on like this, like Japan did for the next, you know, 40 years, 30 years? Well, here's the thing. And the reason why Japan actually allow, was allowed to prolong that is because they are a key economy in the global economy. I mean, does anybody really in their flipping right mind think that the Japanese yen is a flight to safety asset? If you do, <laughs> go to a shrink, you need some help. Yeah, That's absolutely me. not. <laughs> I mean, seriously. But I want to be really, really clear on it. The reason why I don't believe that this is going to be like Japan with that length of time is simply because now everybody's doing it. Everybody is in the same boat. And the only way to get out is to flush the system away from the debt. So there is no way I will put my technical neck and my, I will put my neck on the line for this. Right. You, can, you can say, you heard it here, there is no way on God's green earth that any government will back their currency with gold until all of this garbage is burned off. Because right, there would have to be a reset at that point. It fixes everything where it is. No, I, I definitely agree. I mean, there would definitely have to be like a full reset for them to have to even get to that point, which would be really interesting to see. Um, the other, the, what I meant to bring up earlier, the thing that I forgot was the fact that in addition that the Federal Reserve is now on a temporary basis becoming the lender to international central banks, which is almost essentially making them the world's central bank. Uh, uh -huh. But it's temporary. Uh, so between, yeah. the, between the reserve requirements being taken away and the uh, fact that they're now lending to international central banks, I mean, how do you see all that playing out for the, for the oh rest of the, the You know, it's a catastrophe waiting to happen. And let us not also forget, they have also changed the leverage requirement. For those that don't understand what leverage is, it is debt upon debt upon debt upon debt upon debt and then some more debt on top of that. So, I mean, I mean, this, this is not ending well. There is no way that it can end well in anything other than the ultimate destruction of any itty bitty bit of value left in that fiat money, which is why gold and silver is so important. I agree, I agree. Now, did you I, say, and did, I know you're a crypto person, but I'm also, I'm also, I, I also believe in precious metals as well. So, I mean, I find, right, it, I find value in both. And that was kind of also one of the things I was going to ask you. I mean, I know you don't own any cryptocurrencies. I know you have looked into it and studied some cryptocurrencies, but with the fact that we are running out of physical supplies of gold and silver and people are looking for a store of wealth, I know that you say cryptos are speculative, but do you not think that that could be a, a last resort for people who aren't going to be able to get any sort of precious metals who can't get any silver because they can't really afford it or don't have access to it? Because a lot of those places are closing up like the mom, like all the places around here that had gold and silver that were specifically in that market are no longer open. I don't know if they're going to reopen, but there's no point. They well, don't have, they don't have any inventory to sell. Right. Well, you know, here, here, there's a couple things in there. Number one, a simple answer to what you just said about when people finally realize that they need to CYA cover their assets. Yep. And if they attempt to buy, you know, gold and silver, their ability to do so can be hampered. I mean, we're experiencing something very similar to what we experienced in 2008, except on steroids, <laughs> that when others couldn't get it, gold and silver, we still can. And so the same thing is true today, but you don't get to be picky. And I do think that people will go to cryptocurrencies when they can no longer get the gold and silver. It kind of makes sense. I mean, if you, if you don't have, and some people are looking at Bitcoin and some cryptocurrencies as being like a form of digital gold. Now, I mean, that's a completely different discussion, but you know, people do need to have those safe haven assets. And if we don't have silver and gold available to people, they need to find something. So, I mean, if, 
if people can agree on that, having value and, and storing people's wealth and preserving wealth, then, then you know, more power to everybody. And that would be great. Well, I, 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 in, in many ways, I agree with that. Here's the thing, though. It hasn't been tested yet. This is going to be the test. It is. It's this only is been it's around for. since 2009. Right. Just yeah. like this rise in ETFs and this rise in all of these funny derivatives and all of that. This none of this. This is all getting tested now. Physical gold and silver has been around for 6000 years. Yeah. It has proven itself over and over and over and over again. And while I am 100 percent convinced that digital currencies is the direction that governments want to go in. And I really would like more people to be able to protect their wealth. Um, we'll, we'll see how this plays out, Chris. Yeah, um, it'd be interesting. If, you, and if everything works out and we see something happening with a digital dollar being introduced, I mean, there's been legislation talking about wallet implementation and stuff. So if for some reason ITM happens to get into that game and needs like a tech support crypto, kind of a crypto geek squad, let me know because I'd love to help you guys out. I will like, definitely keep you in mind. I will definitely keep you in mind with it. And I'm sure ITM would as well, because we have to look at everything, but I don't think it's been tested yet, but I think it will be. And I, and right. I do agree with you when people realize that they need to protect themselves and they look to the traditional way, you know, how easily available that's going to be for people is uh, who knows, right? You know, we're looking at premiums, like on silver, you've got spot at 14, 15 bucks an ounce, but to buy an ounce of silver is something like 20 to $25 an ounce. So that goes into like one of the things that I had written down. I mean, we, 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 we see what the, the spot price of gold and silver are, and we see what people are selling physical gold and silver for. And some people are confused by that. And I try to explain to people how the, the gold and silver market price is determined based off of trading, which has nothing to do with the actual physical item. It's just paper. It right. has nothing to do with gold and silver. It's just paper pretending like it's a representation of. So with that being said, can you explain to the general person why you might see uh, like a $14 price for an ounce of silver roughly right now and you can't even buy it for 20, 24, maybe even $30 an ounce right now. So more than 100% over the price. Yeah, I mean, really simply put, there is an unlimited amount of paper and the cost to, to leverage that paper is, uh, you know, for a normal person like you or me, it's $150 to control 500 ounce, 5,000 ounces of silver and 500 ounces of gold. Yeah. So $150 controls roughly with gold, you know, well, it'd probably be close to $900,000 worth of physical product. That's a lot of leverage, but they can create as many contracts as they want just by pushing a button. In the physical world, there is a finite amount of it. It is a true demand supply market. And so that premium difference that you're seeing is based upon huge demand. I mean, goodness gracious, keep in mind that the central banks have been eating up 20% of the gold, global uh, production in gold for since the crisis, roughly. Okay, right. so it's a true supply demand market, and that's the difference. If you want it, guess what? You think I'm turning around? I'm going to sell my gold or silver for fiat paper, for government backed paper, when all it's backed by is their ability to continue to create more debt? That would be a no. Right. Right. Now, into the, I also want to make this point. Uh, and there is documentation that when the spot markets were created for gold, particularly since gold is the primary currency metal, they did so to manipulate how people think about it. Because they knew that once people were allowed to buy it again, that there was going to be a huge rush. So according to their documentation, and there's lots of documentation that we can go where the central bankers are actually talking their, their words, not my words, 
from their meetings, not my imagination, right. where they talk about manipulating that to control people's perception. And having said that, I'll tell you the truth. If I could buy some silver from ITM right now, I mean, clients can, but, but I can't and yeah. the consultants can't because we have to make it available to clients first. If I could, I'd pay way more than 30 bucks an ounce. Why? Because quite frankly, I know what the true value, that fundamental value of an ounce of gold and an ounce of silver is. In fact, I just recently did a video on it and don't hold me to this because obviously I'm not looking at those numbers. But if I remember correctly, the true value of an ounce of gold was north of $11,000. Wow. That means for one ounce of gold, even if it's a raw piece of gold, in other words, not slab, not a collectible, whatever, mm -hmm. if you're buying it for $2,000 an ounce, it's a bargain regardless of what that says. And, and you know, silver follows suit. Um, so what do you remember the fundamental price that you came up? Which is really more what traders look, look at. I'm more of a strategist, but I'll bring this up because, you know, everybody needs to hear everything. I think just recently, the gold-silver ratio, in other words, how many ounces of silver it would take to buy an ounce of gold, was something like 121 to 1. Yeah, and the sounds global about right. average is 16 to 1. Wow. Right? That's a huge now, difference. Now, again, though, am I going to trade my ounce of silver for fiat that I know is going up in flames? Heck no. But right. would I trade it for a bunch of bananas or gas or something that I needed? Barter Heck abilities. Yes. So, yeah. So, you know, I think people need to understand that they can't, they, and it, it's hard, it's a paradigm shift, right? They can't believe what's printed and what we're told because that's not the truth. Right, yeah, because we're not even thinking about all the money that's created in the banks themselves, you know, between like, with the fractional reserve banking it, th that they have no reserve requirement for it right now, which is exactly insane to think about, you know, but most people don't even realize that and, um, did you happen to see the FDIC uh, public service announcement commercials and stuff where they've been making a, basically encouraging people to keep their money in the bank, tell them that it's safe and it's the safest place, like as if they're worried about a bank run? Well, they I, actually, I didn't see those, but I- You gotta check I, those I, out. Let, let's look that up, cause I would like it's to- It's really interesting because between with when they did all that, you know, it was like, I'm not encouraging people to uh, to take all their money on the bank, but what I'm trying to do is provide information so that people can make an educated choice as to what is most beneficial for them and their family. And that, right. you know, kind of like what you do, just lay, lay some information out, let somebody make a choice. I mean, we're not financial advisors. We're just simply right. just trying to offer right. up things that can help. Right, um, and everybody's got to do what they're comfortable with doing. But there was a bank run that was occurring and people were going in in large droves and pulling out as much cash as yeah, they they're could. And limiting. The the limit, yeah, they're limiting. I've been hearing I've been hearing that they're limiting the amount of money like in a lot of different banks that people can withdraw. So they're not allowing people to withdraw full amounts. So they're only allowed to withdraw partial amounts at a time, which yes, is pretty interesting. Well, that's, that's true. But, you know, I think the, the Federal Reserve promised, in fact, there was a 60 Minutes interview with Neil Kashkari and where he was saying, and I can send you that link if you want it, okay. but, you know, uh, he was saying that there's plenty of money for cash for the banks. No problem. I mean, people can take out as much as they want because the Federal Reserve can just create it. It's not a big deal. We can just create it. Well, what happens to the value of it when they create the massive amounts that they're creating? That's if the inflation. And that's the inflation. Yeah. It's crazy to think about. It's, it's absolutely insane. And, you know, one last thing that I wanted to ask you, um, you know, I know you just got done doing a live stream. And, and I also want to mention, too, that you, you recently did two really good interviews. Not that you don't do all good interviews, but two 
in particular, I want to highlight that I'll link down below the one with Gregory Manorino and um, Gerald Salente. Both, both are really good interviews and people definitely need to check Thank those you. out. Now, some people are comparing what is occurring in the aftermath of this to the Great Depression. Um, we've even seen uh, pr Fed presidents come out and kind of say that they think what they're anticipating for unemployment, which is definitely higher than what we've seen in the Great Depression. During the Great Depression, we also saw um, the government do their different acts, which um, one of them was the gold confiscation, where they were making U.S. citizens sell their gold back to um, the U.S. government to help their financial situation. Being that we're in another Great Depression type situation, do you even anticipate the possibility that our government is going to try to enforce United States citizens to sell their gold and or silver back to the government? Um, I, I wish I could say, oh no, they would never do that again. But um, I don't believe that's true. I believe they absolutely will because they're going to need the wealth and fiat is not wealth. That's just pieces of digital paper. So I do. And that's why personally, I don't buy any bullion. Um, I think the best way to look at it is if you can hold it in an IRA, you probably don't want to own it. Okay. Now, I'm not as concerned about silver because the difference between the two is that silver gets used up right, in manufacturing, et cetera, and gold is all recoverable. So it's, it's got a different position. And even though they did indeed confiscate silver back in 33 during the Depression, I, I don't think that is as likely. Okay. But... I'm not even, I don't even have to go back that far to see recent histories like India in 2016 when they demonetized what something like 85% of all of their fiat money that yeah. was out there. Citizens yeah. woke up and they had a few hours. Boom. Yeah, yeah. and then their bills were useless. Exactly. Uh, by the way, they did this with the uh, how with the um, stay in place order too. They did it. They gave people four hours to comply with stay in place. Or if they saw you on the street, they were having you do push ups or ridiculous things like that. As I've people. seen, yeah, I've seen some of those, like where the police are making them do exercises. <laughs> it's like, yeah. It's, Sorry, it's, not not a fan of Modi. Not, not a fan. And that's not the only reasons. But uh, during that period of 2016, they did a door-to-door -door confiscation. Now, of course, the difference was that um, Indians, having been through currency devaluations in the past, don't really trust the government that much, so they have a tendency to wear their wealth. And all of the schemes that they have come out with uh, particularly, they did a brilliant paper, the, the uh, Bank of India mm -hmm. did a brilliant paper in 99 on how to dematerialize gold. And they've been trying to get people to make deposits of their gold with, and hey, then they'll get interest on that money. And hey, you can withdraw the gold whenever you want to. It won't be the gold that you deposited. I mean... It just hasn't been very successful. So they did do a door-to-door -door selective gold confiscation during that period of time. And that is according to the, the head of their department. With that, right. If anybody wants it, you can let me know. I'll send you the link to his Twitter where he discusses it. I mean, that's one of the few things that I haven't really seen anybody really talk about uh, is that possibility of that reoccurring. And, um, you know, being that we are in uh, possibly a worse situation th than that time period, and that's what they did then, it makes sense that we that history would repeat itself. And unfortunately, we don't tend to learn from history. So it's very sad, but, you know, I think that's kind of where we're at. It, it, it's almost, you know, I've had, I've had a lot of people over the years that have said to me, because it's very, it's been, for a lot of people, it's been very frustrating when they believe in what I've been talking about and in gold and silver and how it's been manipulated all these years, suppressed for all these years. And, and so many people have said, well, Lynette, you've been talking about this stuff for years and years and nothing has happened. 
Well, pretty sure they're not saying that piece now, right. but I've had a lot of people say, and they'll deserve it. I don't think anybody, frankly, deserves what we're going through. No. Because we have been taught since the day we were born, we have been taught a lie. So if, if, if the average person was to just go spend a little bit of time in Venezuela, I'm pretty sure that their attitude would be adjusted. Yeah. You know, that's when you have to realize, you know, like what's more important here. You know, I think when you have um, somewhere around like 85% poverty in your country and the, the joke of the Maduro diet where people are basically starving and eating in very small amounts, that, that, that is extremely sad. So, you know, I mean, oh. that's, you know, when we think about hyperinflation, I mean, we say it, but we're not thinking about really how bad the situation is really going to be. And, you know, that's where I've been trying to really encourage people to keep their humanity and be the change they want to see more than ever because we need that. That's why I've been talking about my practice change stuff because it, it, it could be, a, we could all just kind of turn on each other in the flip of the switch and then it's just all hell breaks loose and we've got Mad Max on earth. And, you that's know, that's the point of community, isn't it? Yeah. You which know, is one of your, which is one of your big mottos. It's huge because we do. I mean, that's why I'm out walking and Hey, you know, I see a neighbor. Do you need anything? Because I've been preparing. Yeah. Believe you get food me, away. I can't even tell you how much toilet paper I've given away. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I mean, you know, it seems really silly, but and I know there's a lot of negativity around this. And even I have to talk about all of the negativity that's happening. Well, we got to be realist. There's an opportunity for some positive things to occur as well. You know, number one, since wealth never disappears, it just shifts location. If you're in the right place at the right time with the right asset, then you can have that wealth shift your way instead of shifting away from you. And for me, that's the point of gold is to be able to do that. But also, you know, when, when the, the disease part of it, the sickness part of it ends and people go out and they start spending money again, and then that leads to that hyperinflation, what I really wish people would do is look at what happened to them in the circumstance. Look at what happened when they went to the grocery store and the grocery store shelves were bare. Look at where you felt pain because I think we're going to have an opportunity to get prepared. I've been working on my urban farm since 2010. I moved from a little two bedroom condo into this, you know, it's a half an acre property, but I have planted out every square inch of this property. You even, you even took your swimming pool and filled it up with dirt, right? I, no, I didn't fill it up with dirt. I filled it up. I turned it into a pond and I put floating islands in it. And by the way, I just read yesterday that pennywort, which is a plant that I have growing out there like crazy, um, is extremely nutritious. So I'm going to start eating two leaves a day. They said eat two leaves a day and you'll see if I don't get prettier and things yeah. don't, you know. I'll we'll pay see. attention. I'm what, what's it called? Today. But food becomes the single biggest issue for people when they're going through this circumstance. So if you weren't prepared before, please, please use this as an opportunity to get prepared because I think everybody has seen where they are now vulnerable, except they haven't seen it in the spending part yet. Right. That's the gold and that's the silver. And so frankly, you know, get some. And even if you have a crypto portfolio, that's fine. Just make sure that you use gold and silver to protect that wealth in there. And there, it, there's a formula for it. There so is. it's a balance, mm -hmm. right? It's a totally balance. Agree. Totally agree. And and as far as your uh, the the community aspect and the farming that you do and the growing of your own produce and stuff, I've been really encouraging that, especially considering what's going on now. And even though we're in social distance mode, if you have neighbors and somebody has a big backyard, you could take uh, a group of people and 
and work in sections, have two or three people out at a time uh, within six feet apart from each other. And people right now, because it's the very beginning of spring, it's a good time to be able to like get outside, get some sun, get, you know, cause that's good for our immune system that's as good well. For us. And then we could all be working together and doing something that's for the greater good. And, you know, I think like you said, that community is going to come into play on this, especially if we see the hyperinflation come, um, it's going to be key. I mean, we're going to have to look out for one another. And so to end things, I, I know that there at ITM trading, like you mentioned, that you guys still do have some precious metals, gold and silver available. You're even making it to the point where no one in ITM trading at this point can purchase. Um, it, it's all available to the customers, which I really appreciate. So for anybody who wants to try to take advantage of some of your services and invest in some gold and silver, how can they get in touch with you and how can you guys help them? Well, even though we're all in our own homes right now, we are still working really diligently and we love human contact. So 888-696-4653. And we also, of course, have the website, itmtrading.com. But, you know, they've all been, everybody there, you know, I created a strategy for myself based upon my work with currencies since 1987. And it really is to help people survive what we're, you know, this is just the start of it. It's, it's going to get a whole lot worse. So I it really is. encourage people to call us. The strategy is based on real money, gold and silver. Not to say that you can't do something else, but that's got to be real money is what has survived the test of time. And it really should be the foundation. So the strategy is based on that. All of the consultants have been trained in that strategy. It's the one I'm executing for myself. And then we just customize it. We right. tweak it a little bit because obviously you're at a different stage in your life and in a different circumstance than I am. So it's, it's at the bottom level, it's all the same. But then it's just kind of tweaked. And we like that human contact to help you make educated choices that support your best interest first. What a concept. What a concept. Just so beautiful, man. I love it. Well, was there anything that we didn't cover? Any final thoughts you want to leave with people with before we wrap up? You know, I think we covered, we covered a lot. I think yeah, I mean, I, obviously, obviously I watch your stuff and, you know, I'm, I've been keeping up with what's been happening. So I tried to cover as much as possible with this because I really felt like since the last time I've interviewed you, I mean, that was a really good one for people who need to get some basic understanding of some of the stuff that's happening. But this right here conversation was really what I was really looking forward to kind of getting your perspective on where we're at, because I mean, this is what you've been talking about and preparing people for what other people have been talking about, preparing people for um, Gregory Manorino, Mike Maloney. I mean, there's so many different people out there who have been saying very similar things for quite a Absolutely. long time. So I appreciate what you do. I'm going to have links down below for everything we're talking about. And I, I definitely want everybody there at ITM Trading and yourself to stay as safe and healthy as possible. So thank you once again, Lynette. I appreciate it. Well, it's always a pleasure. I look forward to the next time. Be interesting to see where we're at then. Oh, it would definitely be interesting. And that will conclude today's discussion with Lynette Zhang. So I hope you found value in today's conversation. I am going to have links down below, as I mentioned in the beginning of the video, with the first four interviews that I did do with Lynette Zhang. And I do encourage people to check those interviews out. Considering everything that's happening, I hope that everybody is staying as safe and as healthy as possible. If this is your first time ever watching any of my videos, make sure you explore my channel. Be sure you subscribe, smash the like button, hit the notification bell, check me out on library where I post exclusive content. And as always, I encourage you to be the change by practicing change. And I love you all.